This is section 2.5, Implicit Differentiation. Now, um, most functions you've dealt with in your life have been expressed in their explicit forms. That is, something like this, where um, y is written explicitly as a function of x, like this. So you have y all by itself equal to an expression in x. So this is explicitly defining what y is in terms of x. Um, there are some equations, however, that you could easily rewrite like this one, which is starting out as a function of y explicitly in terms of x. By multiplying both sides by x, this is now implicitly defined. And what that means is that the um, neither variable is solved for in terms of the other. There are equations that you may have remembered from earlier courses where you may have had something like this where x was written explicitly in terms of y and that of course is a parabola that opens to the right instead of up or down. Um, so when you have a, a function or perhaps something that's actually only really a relation but I'll, I'll use the term function um, um, as an implied thing, um, what we can do with that is from this form of the equation, the implicitly, um, of the implicit form of the equation, we can actually find the derivative dy dx. And if this is what we're given, what we would, could do is we could go back and find y as a function of x rewrite it as a power and then find its derivative like this. And that's not that hard to understand how to do. Okay, this great this is great if you can solve an equation for y explicitly in terms of x. However, there are plenty of equations for which you can't do that. Uh, for example, if I gave you this one, I'm pretty sure that nobody knows how to solve um, this equation for y explicitly in terms of x. Um, it's just impossible to do. In fact, most of the time, if you have a mixture of types of functions, like algebraic, trigonometric, logarithmic, exponential, you usually can't make much headway algebraically uh, if you're asked to solve them when there's a mixture of those things in it. So uh, if we want to find the derivative of something like that, we have to use something called implicit differentiation. So it won't have to be in its explicit form to find the derivative. We can find it implicitly. Let's take the equation above that we started with, the first implicitly defined function, and let me show you the technique of implicit differentiation. What we're going to do is add to the list of things that you can do to both sides of an equation. Namely, we're going to add to our list that includes things like you can add the same thing to both sides, multiply both sides by the same thing, etc. We can take the derivative on both sides of the equation with respect to x. Now it's very important that you pay attention to the variable with which, uh, to which you're, um, with respect to what variable you are taking the derivative, because that matters. We are going to infer that y is a function of x that we may or may not be able to solve for y explicitly, but we're going to say that there's something out there that we would understand to be y equals something. 
And so as far as x is concerned, y is just some unknown function of x. So in doing the derivative on the left side, we'll use the product rule. So x, first function, times the derivative of the second. The derivative of y with respect to x is dy dx plus the second function y times the derivative of x, the derivative of x with respect to x is 1. And of course the derivative of a constant is 0. So uh, if I were to solve for dy dx, I might subtract y from both sides and divide both sides by x and there would be an implicit derivative for our implicitly defined function. If we do know how to solve for y, which we do know how to in this one, we can write that derivative explicitly in terms of x by substitution. So substituting 1 over x in for y and simplifying you get the opposite of 1 over x squared. Of course, the same answer we got before. So that's the gist of um, implicit differentiation is you differentiate both sides of the equation as they are with respect to x, keeping in mind that when you're doing the derivative of y, it's an unknown function. So that's going to act kind of like you did when we uh, were talking about chain rule y is just some unknown function of x and its derivative is dy dx. Um, okay, so let's do one that's a little bit more complicated. Um, how about the one up there? It's probably the most complicated thing I've written for you to find the derivative for. Let's do this one. I'm going to rewrite it so that I can move the screen and uh, have all the work visible down below. Now, since I can't solve this one explicitly for y, it's impossible, um, I'm not going to worry about the whole idea of writing the derivative answer in terms of only x. The implicit form of the derivative will be the best we can do. Okay, so if we take the derivative on both sides with respect to x, will look like this. And so again, that d dx symbol means we're doing something to what's behind it. It means it's an, it's an action, it's a verb. Do something. Find the derivative of what follows. And by the way, I'm going to rewrite uh, square root of y as y to the one half and bring that one half out in front to make this a little bit easier to deal with. Okay, so the derivative of the first item is, a, since it's a product, will be first function times derivative of the second plus second function times derivative of the first. Then the derivative of cosine of something is negative sine of that something and because of the chain rule, it multiply by the derivative of that something, dy dx, minus the derivative of tangent x is secant squared x, equals the derivative of e to the x is coolest function ever, e to the x, minus one half times the derivative of natural log of something is 1 over that something times the derivative of that something. Then our task will be to solve for dy dx. So I'm going to do a couple of things. Um, I'm going to get all of the dy dx things on the left hand side of the equation together. So um, I did skip a term because it doesn't have a dy dx in it. Um, actually, I'll be getting rid of that on the left side by subtracting 2xy from both sides. Then I'm also going to add to both sides 
uh, 1 over 2y dy dx. That's to move all the dy dx things to the left side. And then on the right side, the e to the x that was there stays there. Um, then I'm going to add the 2xy and add the secant squared x. So all of those terms should be correct from the line above. Some have stayed on the side they were on. Some have moved to the other side um, by addition or subtraction from both sides. Then, since we have several dy dx's, what we will do is we'll factor out dy dx as a common factor. Even if there are other common factors, I don't really care about them because I want to solve for dy dx. So when I factor out the dy dx, I will have x squared minus sine of y plus 1 over 2y equals the right hand side. Oh, I see that I made a mistake. Let me go back and fix that. Sorry about that. I probably said the correct thing and just did the wrong thing. Um, I noticed that I wrote plus 2xy, uh, which of course is incorrect because on the left side of the equation it was positive. So if I subtract it from both sides, it'll make it negative on the right hand side. Let me double check I didn't make any other errors like that. Okay, that looks good. Okay. All right, I think the rest of it's fine. So please take my apology for that mistake. But luckily I caught it and it didn't stay there for very long after all. And then to um, solve for dy dx, since it's multiplied by something, we'll have to divide both sides by that something to get dy dx isolated, solved for. And then there's one last simplification thing, which I believe we've talked about before. We can't leave a fraction inside of a bigger fraction like this 1 over 2i. And since it's the only fraction, this is going to be pretty easy. Um, I need to find the common denominator of all the little fractions, which is 2i, the only fractions denominator, um, and multiply by 1 in the form of that common denominator over itself. And uh, so dy dx is equal to 2y e to the x minus 4xy squared plus 4y secant squared x divided by, um, let's see, 2x squared y minus 2y sine of y plus 1. And that would be my final answer. There is, uh, that 2y in the numerator uh, could have been left factored uh, out. Um, but I decided just to leave it alone uh, because we were distributing everything. I thought I'd uh, just do that consistently. So you wouldn't wonder why sometimes I distributed and sometimes I did not. Okay, I did have a mistake on that last example. And here is the corrected version of that. It's just a tiny mistake that I made in this line right here. I accidentally inserted a coefficient for secant squared of 2, which doesn't belong. This is actually correct, plus secant squared x, not plus 2 secant squared x, which means that the final answer should be this. So that third term of the numerator should be 2y secant squared x, not 4y secant squared x. So please look at this answer. This one is correct. I made a mistake. 
I accidentally uh, was looking up at the line above and pulled that 2 from the 2xy down in front of secant squared x because I was talking about something else and got distracted and accidentally put in a 2 that does not belong. So please make sure that you've got this corrected version of that example and uh, not the one I did before. All right, so um, so let's uh, back off a bit and look at some simpler examples now. Um, if I ask you what is the derivative with respect to x of x cubed, well, with respect to x, and that's a function of x, we're just going to be following the good old same rules we've been doing. That's what we've been doing all along. However, if I ask you to take the derivative with respect to x of a something like y that's cubed, the variable is not the same as the variable with which you're uh, taking the derivative um, with respect to it. So this is a something cubed, and according to the chain rule, that's going to be three times that something to the reduced by one power times the derivative of the inside function dy dx. And that's what that derivative looks like. Um, and you don't need that dot for multiplication. You can just write those up next to each other, implying that multiplication if you want to. Okay, so... Uh, try this one. See if you can find the derivative with respect to x of x plus 3y. So pause the recording, find that derivative, and, and then check. turn it back on to check. Okay, so the derivative of x, the first thing, with respect to x, of course, is 1, plus 3 times something. The derivative of 3 times something using the const constant multiplier is going to be three times the derivative of that something and the derivative of y with respect to x is dy dx and that's that's your derivative okay now try this one part d by yourself and then turn the recording back on Find the derivative with respect to x of the product xy squared. Okay, try that. Okay, welcome back. First function times the derivative of the second one. The derivative of y squared, something squared, is 2 times that something to the first times the derivative of that something. The derivative of y with respect to x is dy dx plus the second function, y squared, times the derivative of the first function. Well, the derivative of x with respect to x is 1. And I want to show you something. If I had written this like I did on the left side, the derivative of y with respect to x, if I'd said times the derivative of x with respect to x, I would have gotten dx dx, kind of like the dy dx in the first term. But dx dx, since they're the same variable, simplifies to be 1. And so it is innerly consistent with itself here that if you think of the derivative of x with respect to x, it will be a 1, and you will get the right answer. Okay, so um, that means that this would simplify to be 2xy dy dx plus y squared. All right. So on the next slide, there are guidelines for implicit differentiation. So let's uh, kind of review what we did up above. Let's see if this uh, corresponds to what we did. So looking at the example, oops, can't make it center where I want. Okay, look, the x squared y plus cosine y, et cetera, that one. We said differentiate both sides of the equation with respect to x. That was this line right here. Take the derivative on both sides with respect to x. 2. Collect all terms involving dy dx on the left side of the equation and move all other terms to the right side of the equation. That's what we did right here. 
after, of course, doing the derivative um, in that middle step. So it's not to be neglected. They just assumed that you would, when they said differentiate both sides, that you would actually follow through and do the derivative. Then 3, factor dy dx out of the left side of the equation, which is what we did in this line right here. And then solve for dy dx, which involved division in this step right here. And of course, then we, we simplified, which we, you should always simplify your answers, even if the directions do not say so. That's just an, an implied thing that you should know since algebra that you always want to simplify everything. All right, so let's try, or have you try this one, y cubed plus y squared minus 5y minus x squared equals negative 4. Okay, so uh, turn off the recording, go through those four steps, and then turn on the recording and see if you got the correct answer. Okay, so the first step would be to differentiate on both sides of the equation with respect to x. And you know it's with respect to x because usually the directions will say find dy dx and whatever that denominator differential is is the derivative um, the variable that you used uh, to find the derivative with respect to it. Okay, so we're differentiating both sides of the equation with respect to x. All right, so the derivative of something cubed is 3 times that something squared times the derivative of that something, and the derivative of y with respect to x is dy dx, plus the derivative of uh, something squared is 2 times that something to the first, times the derivative of that something with respect to x, minus 5 times the derivative of y is 1 times the derivative of that something. This is the one you may have forgotten to do. The derivative of y with respect to x is dy dx minus the derivative of x squared because it's the same variable as dx. The derivative of x squared with respect to x is 2x and the derivative of the constant is 0. So step 2 is to um, write everything that has dy dx in it on the left side where they all are actually to begin with and anything that is not a dy dx term move to the other side so I'm going to add 2x to both sides then factor out the dy dx even if there are other common factors we don't care about that right now. We're trying to solve for dy dx. So we're factoring out the dy dx. And then we're going to solve for dy dx by division. Divide both sides of the equation by that trinomial. And you'll get 2x all over 3y squared plus 2y minus 5, okay? So um, that would be the final answer unless we could factor that trinomial. And I think it does factor. Um, remember that test for factorability. We can use that if you want to. b squared minus 4ac for that denominator trinomial is 2 squared minus 4 times 3 times negative 5. Let's see, that's 64, which is a perfect square, which means this does factor. And since 3 is prime, I'll assume it's 3y times y that gets me there. Now I need to think of what factors of negative 5 put in the correct position will give me a sum of positive 2y. And that's going to be if this is 5 and this is 1, 3y and 5y do subtract to be 2y. I have to make sure that the 5 is positive. So plus 
5y, and the 3y would be negative, so y minus 1. Yes, that's correct, and so that's my final answer for that one. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. To see how you can use an implicit derivative, consider the graph of the figure in 2.27. So take a look at that. Um, I assume that I put this in the notes. From the graph, you can see that y is not a function of x because it doesn't pass the vertical line test. Even so, the derivative found in example 2 gives a formula for the slope of the tangent line at a point on this graph. Okay, so did we do that? Yes, that was the, the one we just did. y cubed plus y squared minus 5y minus x squared equals negative 4. That's what's graphed. The original function for this problem we just finished is um, the derivative of that function. So it can be used to find the slope of the tangent line to that curve anywhere on that curve, well, as long as we don't divide by zero. So um, let's just do a couple of examples. But what's the slope of the curve at the point when... Um, the curve is at the point to zero. So notice I need to evaluate with um, this derivative with regard to knowing both x and y because both x and y are needed to find my derivative answer. So because x is two, this will be two times two over. Since y is zero, this will be three times zero plus five multiplied by 0 minus 1 and uh, that ends up being negative 4 fifths and if you look at the graph at the point to 0 does it appear that that is a logical derivative it's pretty close to negative 1 and at that point the the tangent line would be a, a line that has negative slope. So yeah, I think that's pretty logical. Um, how about at the point 1, negative 3? By the way, this is the notation. If you want to use the Leibniz notation and you want to find a slope, you have to evaluate the derivative at either x equals something for an explicitly defined derivative or um, with respect to x and y here, with both being needed, um, we're going to have to evaluate this derivative at the point 1, negative 3. If you look at the graph, you're expecting a positive slope that's not very steep, so kind of close to 0 is what I'm anticipating we'll see. Okay, so 2 times 1 divided by 3 times negative 3 plus 5 multiplied by negative 3 minus 1 and if you do that arithmetic you should get 1 eighth okay so that makes sense okay so Looks like we have uh, done pretty well. Uh, let's do two more of those. What's the slope? And this time it's going to seem kind of odd, but actually it ends up not being necessary to, in this one case, we don't need to say what x and y are. In this particular example, if x happens to be 0, we'll have 2 times 0 over whatever, something times something, as long as that something isn't 0. So when x is 0, we can't let y be 1 or negative 5 thirds. And when x is 0, if you look at the graph, it looks like it's kind of close to negative 3. I don't know exactly what it is, but it certainly isn't 1 or negative 5 thirds. So 0 divided by any non-zero thing will be 0. And of course, that should make sense. Because at that point, that low point, that is a point where the tangent line will be horizontal, which means the slope is zero. It makes perfect sense. Okay, now one more. Let's uh, see if we can find this slope 
at the point 1, 1. So that will be 2 times 1 divided by 3 times 1 plus 5 is 8. And y minus 1 is, uh-oh, 0. Yeah, that's undefined. And that means that there is no slope. And if there's no slope, that means that we have a vertical tangent line. And if you look at the picture of this function at 1, 1, it totally makes sense that at that point there's a vertical tangent line. Um, now in the next slide it says it's meaningless to solve for dy dx in an equation that has no solution points. For example, x squared plus y squared equals negative 4. There are no number, real numbers, x and y, that you could square them and then add them and get a negative answer. So finding dy dx for this doesn't have any meaning. It's nonsense. So um, if, however, there were a part of a graph that can be represented by a differentiable function, then dy dx will have meaning as the slope at each point on the segment. Okay. So the fact that that uh, function, and that wasn't a function, that relation that we just found the slopes for, it has a graph, and at every point there is a tangent line possible, and we could find the slope of each of those tangent lines. So recall uh, that a function is not differentiable at points with vertical tangents. As we just saw, the slope has no value because we're trying to divide by zero, so, and that told us that it was a vertical tangent line. Um, and a function is not differentiable at any point where the function is not continuous. So let's try this one. If y is equal to cosine inverse of x, what I'd like for us to do is to find dy dx and write the answer in terms of x. So I want an explicit answer. I want to find dy dx in terms of x. Okay, so um, have we talked about the derivative of inverse trig functions? I don't think we have. So what I'm going to go back to is a pre-calculus notion that what does this inverse cosine of x mean? It means that there's some angle y that if we took the cosine of that y, it would give us the answer x. That's a pre-cal notion of how to solve an equation of an inverse trig function for a new equation such that it's in terms of a trig function instead of the inverse trig function. Then to find dy dx, I'm going to use implicit differentiation. That's the topic from today. So I'm taking the derivative on both sides with respect to x. And the derivative of cosine of something is negative sine of that something multiplied by the derivative of that something with respect to x. There's the chain rule. And then the derivative of x with respect to x is 1. So solve for dy dx and you'll get negative 1 over sine of y, which is fine, um, but the direction said we want the answer to be in terms of x, and in, unfortunately it's right now in terms of y. So I'd like for you to go back to this notion right here, that equation, and think about what that means if you have a right triangle. And if y is the angle right here, if this is the angle y, then cosine is defined as adjacent 
over hypotenuse. And I'm going to think of x as x over 1. So that means that the side adjacent to angle y, which is this one, will be x, and the hypotenuse will be 1. And in this problem right here, I have an answer that right now is in terms of y. And in, in fact, it's in terms of sine of y. So what I want to find out is what is the sine of that's the angle y that we've already referenced as being an angle whose cosine will equal x. Well, we know the definition of sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So I need to figure out what is this opposite side in order to do this. Because of the Pythagorean theorem, we know that the right triangle will have a relation with all three sides in the following manner. Leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. And so that means that the square of the opposite side by subtraction is equal to 1 minus x squared. And so the opposite side will be the square root of 1 minus x squared. So that means that the sine of y is opposite this radical over hypotenuse, which is 1, or more simply just the square root of 1 minus x squared. So if we go back over to our dy dx answer, where we left off, and substitute for sine of y with what we just solved to be equal to sine of y, the square root of 1 minus x squared. And so that means that we now know the derivative of the inverse cosine function, at least we've gotten that one done. is negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. In fact, that's how you could approach doing all six inverse trig functions of x. You could do this exact same kind of process. Notice that the answer for the derivative of the inverse trigonometric function is an algebraic function. Uh, when you have a polynomial like 1 minus x squared and the square root of that, of that still algebraic and 1 divided by that algebraic expression itself is algebraic. And so anyway, um, kind of an interesting answer that the derivative of an inverse trig function is algebraic. Okay, so let's go to the next example. We're about to run out of room. I think maybe I'll go to another page for this. So uh, we're almost done. Unfortunately, I just don't have room to do it. So nope, I, I think I know what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to do something I've maybe done with you before, but I'm going to move this over and go here. Okay. So I've got more blank space to work with. So the directions are to take the graph three times the quantity x squared plus y squared, quantity squared, which is equal to 100 xy. And we're to, to, to determine the slope of the graph find the slope of the graph when we're at the point on the graph 3, 1. Okay. All right. Very abbreviated version of that question up above. Just so I can look at the screen and not look, keep looking back at the piece of paper I have this written. 
Okay, so to find the derivative, which is how we get to the slope, we're going to use the implicit differentiation technique. So we're going to start by taking the derivative on both sides with respect to x. And what I'd like for you to do is pause the recording and see if you can at least find the derivative on both sides with respect to x. In other words, do the implicit differentiation. Don't forget the chain rule. I'll come back in a second. Uh, uh, pause the recording. Well, I want you to come back after you've done it and see how you did. So pause the recording now. All right, well, let's see how you did. Um, the constant multiple rule means that three times whatever's behind it, the derivative of that will be three times that thing behind its derivative. I know it wasn't very good English, but hopefully you get the idea. Now I have a big something squared, and its derivative is 2 times that something to the reduced by 1 power, so to the first. Then the chain rule kicks in and says times the derivative of the inside something. The derivative of x squared with respect to x is simply 2x, plus the derivative of something squared with respect to x is 2 times that something to the first power, times the derivative of that inside something, the derivative of y with respect to x. Okay, so that's the derivative of the left side. And on the right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to treat the first function as if it were 100x, and the second function is y. Um, it's just one way to treat this, and that's the way I'm going to decide to do it. So the derivative of that product will be first function times the derivative of the second one, the derivative of y with respect to x is dy dx, plus the second one times the derivative of the first, and the derivative of 100x is 100. Okay, so let's see. I think what I'm going to do next is... Um, Let me see. I think what I want to do is to. I'm thinking, hold on. I'm trying to decide how I want to do that. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and slow myself down a little bit and not do much on this first line. I'm just multiplying basically 3 times 2. And then that will be distributed. So um, that answer will be multiplied by 2x plus, and then that same thing when distributed will be multiplied by the 2y dy dx. The main reason I had to distribute was I needed to be able to get the dy dx term by itself. So that fact that it was within parentheses meant I couldn't get it by itself until I did that distribution. Okay, so this will be 12x times x squared plus y squared. And this will be 12y times x squared plus y squared times dy dx equals 100x dy dx. Okay, so next step is I want all the dy dx terms on the left. So the 12y times x squared plus y squared dy dx is already on the left, so it'll stay there. Then I'll subtract 100x, and I just forgot to write this 100y up here. I think I was already thinking about the next step, and I forgot to write it, so please excuse that. So I subtract 100x dy dx 
from both sides to move the dy dx term to the left side. Then on the right, the 100y is already on the right with no dy dx. And I'll subtract 12x times x squared plus y squared from both sides because it doesn't have a dy dx on it either. Okay, then we're supposed to factor out the dy dx, even though there are other things that are common factors. That's not the most important thing right now. So we're trying to solve for dy dx. So if I factor dy dx out, I'll be left with 12y times x squared plus y squared. minus 100x and this will be 100y minus 12x times x squared plus y squared. Okay, now then, um, what we'll want to do then is to divide both sides by what dy dx is multiplied by to get dy dx by itself. So that's going to be 100y, the original right hand side here, the step above, divided by 12y times x squared plus y squared minus 100x. And let me see, I could factor out, I believe 4 is a common factor for all terms. So I'm going to factor out the 4, leaving 25y minus 3x times x squared plus y squared divided by 4 times 3y times x squared plus y squared minus 25x and then simplifying here's my final answer 25y minus 3x times x squared plus y squared divided by 3y times x squared plus y squared minus 25x. Okay, so there's that one. Okay, um, now the graph of that func of oh, that's not function, but the graph of that relation is a lemniscate. skate. Um, I'll do my best to, to make it look good. Um, really takes computer graphics to draw things like this so that they look really decent. It's that lemniscate. skate. And I want you to know that there is a point on this lemniscate skate at 3, 1. And what I'd like for us to do is to find the slope of that curve at 3, 1, which is you know, what the original directions said. So the slope will be calculated by taking our derivative answer and evaluating it. That's what the vertical bar means, is evaluate what's in front of it when you're at the point 3, 1, which means when x is 3 and when y is 1. So by substitution, that's 25 times 1 
minus 3 times 3 times 3 squared plus 1 squared divided by 3 times 1 times 3 squared plus 1 squared minus 25 times 3. Okay, and do that arithmetic and you should get 13 ninths. And to me it sort of makes sense if you think about it that the slope of this tangent line to that curve would have a positive slope and it's reasonable that it would be somewhere between 1 and 2 which 13 ninths is between 1 and 2 so that's that's reasonable um, the picture is not good enough to determine if that's perfect or not but it certainly doesn't contradict what I expect okay so that ends this lesson I will see you in class